what, what's your definition of the word ghost? Anyone? Yeah, you think of Casper. Uh, but what we found was that one person will, will, will refer to the term ghost, and another person will refer to the same term, but they'll have a fairly different meaning. And so one of the things that we thought about trying to do was to create kind of like a standardized dictionary that says, you know, when you say this term, that's what it means. And, and what you do by, uh, you know, by establishing this uh, connection is that one group, when they use the term, that, that's going to mean the same thing for another group. And what that does is when you standardize that, you allow different groups to be able to share information more efficiently. And that's pretty much what we're trying to do as a primary goal uh, in our field of investigations. And uh, one of the uh, mechanisms that we're going to try to use is creating an online database of pretty much every uh, <laughs> paranormal, paranormal term that we can think of. And uh, in order to do this effectively, we need input from multiple groups, preferably as many groups as we can get. And uh, it, you know, it, 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 it's to establish uh, an openness between all the different organizations. So that instead of all these organizations being like small islands uh, with their own little pieces of information and their own ideas, we all start becoming like one big island. And then everybody still has their individuality. It's just that now everybody starts to understand what the other groups are doing. Uh, for example, sometimes one group might have a certain technique that's very effective, but most, more, you know, more more often than not, they're not going to share that with other people because they just don't think, you know, that they are interested in that information, or maybe sometimes they covet it for whatever reason. And all we're trying to do is create more of an openness so that different groups will be able to share their successful techniques with other groups, so that as a whole, we start building like a larger foundation as a science. And right now, I, I just don't see it, that happening very often. And I just thought that'd be a good idea to help groups start integrating with one another uh, in that particular uh, in that particular part of investigating. And to give you uh, to illustrate further, uh, for example, we look at uh, val validity and reliability. And uh, anybody know what I'm talking about at all as far as validity? Like, let's say for example, uh, you're using like a camera. And uh, th th is the camera going to produce a picture or is it going to produce something else? You know, we, we need equipment that we know for a fact has a certain type of output and usability. And of course, that, that's a very simplified uh, you know, idea there, but that's how scientists think. They need to know this particular device will do this one thing and you're going to get this type of output. And so as, as researchers ourselves, when we present data, we don't use things like, say, thousand rods uh, for the scientific portion of the investigation. And it's not that we dislike thousand rods. In fact, you know, we'll run around with them. We may try to use them to isolate or identify an area or a hot spot. It's just that when you go down and you put something down on paper, nobody seems to be able to come up with a, a scientific base theory of, you know, how to quantify what output a dowsing rod gives you. You know, I'll talk to one person, they'll say, oh, well, if they cross forward, that means one thing. If it crosses backwards, it means another thing, or swings out, whatever. But there's no general consensus to that. So as a result, we can't really use that in the scientific reporting. Whereas, like, say, with a, you know, with a certain type of electromagnetic detector or a compass or whatnot, we know that a compass is sensitive to magnetism. And you can actually tell by how fast the needle moves, whether or not, you know, the, the strength of that particular magnetism. That can be measured, that can be applied, and presented as, as you know, tangible, tangible data. And so as a result, that's kind of what we're trying to do, is we're trying to illustrate uh, validity, uh, validity and reliability. Uh, and of course, on the reliability side, you have the whole problems of, as far as like, say, using dowsing rods, you know, there's no, I, I guess it's not a meter. So you can't really sit down and put that on a piece of paper. You can't apply a number to that. And if you can't apply a number to it, then you can't use it in a scientific manner. Because the scientific community will not accept uh, hearsay information at all. They need things that they can put into equations and they can run numbers, so to speak. And so as a result, we're trying to create this, this infrastructure uh, that different groups use and we share each other's information. 
hello, uh, to, uh, you know, to start building a more strict foundation for the science as a whole. And uh, so, so, anyways, that's kind of what, uh, what we're about and what we're trying to do with other groups. So, uh, if you get a chance later, stop by and, and see one of the guys in blue at the, uh, at the, at the booth up there. Uh, our website, www.theprojectgroup.org. And uh, of course, the Ghostly Talk guys come down here to give some support. <laughs> and uh, thanks for standing here in the heat and watching me almost pass out. And uh, thanks for coming out to the uh, event this year. We've had a heck of a turnout. It's been fantastic. If you get a chance, thank Jeff Wamsley. Uh, they really worked really hard to get this thing going, and it's been a fantastic event. So thank you very much. Thanks to all the new friends we've made. It's been really great. It's really wonderful down here. Thank you. Any questions? I do have a small question. Um, you know, you watch a lot of these paranormal shows on television, you see them, and they walk around with things to measure, like electromagnetic fields and things like that. And you're finding, and a lot of times when you see maybe even an old houses or things like that, where a lot of it possibly could be from bad light fixtures, things like that. In your research, what have you found? What percentage of the results you get are from that type of phenomenon and from versus what's come from unexplained phenomena? Yeah, what he asked was, uh, <laughs> as far as like TV shows and, and things of that nature, people who are using these uh, electromagnetic devices, for example, uh, he, he was asking how often do we think that we're getting like false positives or if it's just bad lighting or whatnot. And to be honest with you, I say about 100%. I say about 100% of the time that we're using these uh, pieces of equipment, we get false positives. And that brings up an interesting, po uh, interesting point because what we're trying to do is find equipment that works outside of that particular frequency. I mean, we all know that typical household lighting works between 50 and 60, you know, hertz. So if you can find equipment that is sensitive to electromagnetism outside of that range, then normal household, you know, grounded electrical will not set that equipment off. So the idea is to start making, you know, lateral scales that say, we know that in this range, we could safely detect most things in a home or I should say not detect most things in a home. So it doesn't interfere with the equipment. Uh, another thing too might be like, uh, of course infrared light is sensitive to like those little uh, handheld thermometers people use. You ever ran one of those in front of like one of those Sony night cam? You'll see like a ball of light zipping around the room. And uh, so I've seen that happen before. People come back and they're all freaked out because they see all this stuff going on. Uh, and then that's a, a perfect example. And also, obviously, paying attention to one piece of equipment that might affect another piece. Uh, and we're trying to come up with like just general techniques, talk to other groups, what works, what doesn't work. And then eventually, once we start pooling everybody's knowledge together, then it, it's just going to work better because everybody's going to know what everybody else knows. And that's pretty much the theme of what we're trying to do. So, of course, these guys are already doing that. <laughs> so. Any other questions? Yeah. You mean, in other words, do you think the electromagnetic field is the uh, the cause? tangent here, so forgive me. <laughs> what it, in case you didn't hear the question, you basically asked, uh, if I'm right, that uh, do, do we think that electromagnetic fields are the cause uh, of a lot of problems, energy in a home? And I, I guess it boils down to whatever your point of view is. Uh, typically, the way I look at it is, if, if a spirit, or, or there's some kind of a transfer or transition of energy, uh, it has to affect our world through some element of physics, whether it's uh, kinetic energy or hopefully not nuclear energy. But whatever it is, anytime there's a transfer of energy, there's a release of energy. 
And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to guess or detect that byproduct. And if we can figure out a reliable way to test a certain type of byproduct, whether it's electromagnetic or electromagnetism uh, or certain types of nuclear or gravity. Uh, and by the way, electromagnetism pretty much covers every type of energy that we pretty much ever interact with minus the gravity thing, uh, which uh, is bad <laughs> in a way because you don't think of sound as being an electromagnetic energy, but technically it is. Uh, and and I, my thought is that if, if you were to be able to move a spirit from one realm or uh, dimension into another, then it's going to give some sort of byproduct energy, signature, if you will. And hence, I think the idea is trying to guess what that signature is. And who's to say that ghosts interact at 50 hertz? And most guys that I've met, they're running around with 50 hertz detectors. So what if a ghost or whatever, <laughs> some sort of entity uh, operates on 80 hertz. Well, you're not going to catch it on the 50 hertz device. And if it's not a visible object, then you're not going to get it on camera or film. So, you know, how do you detect that? You know, the only way to do that is try to move equipment into those different fields. And of course, you're talking about elevating the cost of such devices because, you know, you'll have to get specially made uh, industry type stuff. So. Hopefully that answers you. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, thanks a lot. You're free. Run. Thanks a lot, everyone, for coming out. Uh, that concludes a lot of speakers, so please enjoy the rest of the festival, and hope we, we hope to see you next year. Thanks a lot.